I will tell you about something that we're really excited about that I think is a good showcase for why we need all the things we've been hearing about in this session before and, and earlier on uh, from Lifetime in order to make them re uh, really applicable for, um, for helping patients and for doing science. So one of the kind of dreams, you know, if you go to Star Trek, they have this device. In other places, they have this gate that you go to through or whatever. It's kind of non-invasive, perfect uh, uh, scanning of a body for all, everything that happens inside. And, and clearly, if we had this, we could do a lot of uh, interesting things. Um, so we, we are not going to get there, but we're going to get very close by various things. And one of the most useful sources of information is from the bloodstream. And most of you probably have heard of the story about cell-free DNA, DNA that is uh, ex uh, ex coming from dead cells to uh, the bloodstream and can be collected when we take a blood sample. And this has been very hot in the cancer field to do liquid biopsies for cancer. Um, the problem is that if we are not talking about cancer, we're talking about, say, a liver inflammation, um, all somatic cells have the same DNA sequence, and therefore there is very little differences that we can detect. There, there are some, but I'm skipping all the details. But basically, it's very hard to get information out of the sequences that we see uh, from the cell-free DNA. However, uh, we know for many years, but it hasn't been appreciated in the field, is that cell-free DNA is not cell-free DNA. It's actually cell-free chromatin. It's pieces of chromatin from the cell that underwent apoptosis that were chopped and released to the blood. And as such, they carry a lot of information. And so I'll try to, talk to, to convince you that we can use this to essentially get a lot of information about somatic tissues from a blood sample. So for those who are not versed in all the details of epigenomics, although I, I assume you know everything, there, I'll mention just briefly two types of information. One type is DNA methylation. So the same DNA sequence, but methylated or not methylated, can come from different tissue. Usually it's, you know, unmethylated promoters are active, methylated promoters are silent and so on, but it's much more complicated than that. Um, and these usually report on lineage because they're very stable through uh, development. Another source of epigenetic information is chromatin marks. So as transcription, cell division, DNA damage repair, and other processes go over the, nucle over the DNA, they change in a post translational modification the, the histones and leave their mark that we can read. And, and there is a bunch of us that made a career out of reading those from the genome and, and annotating genome based on, on these marks. Um, and this can change when we turn on a gene, the marks for that gene can change. So can we use this information? So here is a very cartoonish example, but we'll try to make this case. Uh, the albumin promoter is, is the same in all of our cells, but the albumin chromatin is different because in liver cells, this is an active promoter that is marked with active uh, chromatin marks, while in other cells it's not active. And if those cells die and release their nucleosomes into the plasma, they get mixed up together, and we already don't, we don't know where they came from. But we can do a pull down for the active uh, promoter mark and, and remain just with the nucleosome with this mark and sequence them, and then we can map them to the DNA, and then we can say, oh, we found fragments of the albumin promoter coming down with an active promoter mark, and then we can apply the reasoning that therefore there is some level of death of hepatocytes. So using this information, we can learn about something that happened in the body. I hope that was clear enough. I have no idea where the time is, so I will talk until they kick me out, I guess. Um, <laughs> Okay, so shameless advertisement. This is not trivial to do, uh, but people have been doing it recently uh, for DNA methylation, and I urge you to see poster 62 where Tommy Kaplan will talk about some of those kind of results. And my own poster 78 is about the fact that we can do chip sec from plasma 
and actually read some of those things. And I'll try to give you a sense of what we know how to do today and what we don't know how to do, which I think is the more interesting part. Um, so just to convince, for those who know chromatin, the chipset works, it looks like chromatin, it smells like chromatin. Uh, if you don't know it, don't worry. And if you look at the level of individual places of the genome, it also looks like chipset from tissue. So it actually is a legit signal. Um, and so when we look at healthy people, at the level of DNA methylation, we use marks of methylation that are specific, say, the albumin promoter, as, as we used, mentioned before. And for ChIP-SEC, we look at uh, atlases of, uh, of ChIP-SEC from the roadmap epigenomics and other to define promoters that are cell type specific. We can kind of detect the, the cell types, the names we use in those two graphs that are from two different groups um, are not identical, but they more or less agree in terms of what they see. Um, so mo there is certain blood cells that die a lot. There is some liver cell dying. There is endothelial cells. There are a few other things. But human people, you, uh, human people, healthy subjects vary, but around this line. But when we look, when we talk, we look at people that suffer from some pathology, uh, and here is a extreme case example. We went to people who suffered heart attack, uh, not because heart attack is hard to diagnose, but because heart attack is a very extreme case of cell type that's not supposed to be dying, dying. Um, and then we can detect uh, promoters that are heart specific, and we can actually follow during time and see what happens to these uh, signatures of, of different tissues. Uh, as the patient uh, underwent uh, operation and then started to recover. And surprisingly, we found that there is liver death involved in heart attack, and the MDs told us, yeah, you're right. You, we kind of, you, they teach you that um, in ER, but we didn't know about it, so hooray. Um, a much more interesting case, and again, it's a, I use it as a positive example, but it's a positive example that shows the limitation is when there is a gene that is not supposed to be expressed at all in a healthy adult, and you see the promoter of that gene, you can de deduce something about it. These two transcripts that are kind of showing how much we find them in one of the cancer patients are transcripts that are expressed only in certain types of cancers, or certain subtypes of cancer, they have meaningful implication for the treatment, what type of biological um, drug will work, and the fact that we see them tells us a lot, and it's, it's kind of a makes sense to guess that this comes from the tumor. Okay, so that's all very exciting, but the, the challenge is essentially, and, and it has a lot of implication, just to mention few, uh, everybody thinks about early diagnosis, that's the hardest, but many other examples are monitoring disease progress. We have a serious need for, say, liquid biopsy for liver. We have 25 of the adult population who suffer from fatty liver disease. Many of those, will, this will develop into various forms of, of much more dangerous disease. It's very hard to follow that disease, except for taking liver biopsies that are not perfect, and as you imagine, not fun to, to go through. And if we could do it with liquid biopsy, we can get much better treatment of the patient, but moreover, we can start understanding the disease because we'll have actual observation of what happens to the patient before they show up at the hospital in bad shape. But there's a lot of basic science questions that we want to ask. We don't know even when do we turn over our, our liver cells, more in the morning or in the afternoon, which zone of the liver and so on. Um, so what is the challenge? The challenge is that the biological process that generates this data is essentially one that is working against us. The way I would like to think of it, you have a bunch of uh, uh, documents. They're being translated through automatic translation um, to another foreign language and then shredded up and we get to see the shreds. Um, so I found very specific words that I could say, oh, this word says cancer, but I couldn't really parse the sentences out of these, um, these shredders. So we really want to reconstruct what's, what is the population of cells that died and what was their state 
from this mishmash of everything that's been pulled together. Um, and so this is where I think the ability of having a project like Lifetime is important because I'm overgeneralizing in terms of uh, what Lifetime is doing. We can talk about multi-levels of state, state of the organism, the organ, and so on, states of the cell, and what we can measure from them. But if we don't understand what are the, and again, I'm, I won't repeat all the you know, hidden representation and so on that we, we are coming from, but what are the constraints on the system and from which we can reconstruct what kind of mixture arrived in the blood, we will not be able to draw interesting conclusion from very informative measurements like the one I described. And this is probably going to be true for many other assays that don't go single cell measurements of the patient. So my point here is to add to the fact that we don't just need to plan on doing single cell measurements for every patient that we want to diagnose. We might have many other assays, but the single cell information, not just transcriptomic, but many others, will be useful in terms of allowing us to actually make sense of what we measure in a more ready fashion from, say, the kind of things I, I, I mentioned. Um, and I think, um, I think all of those were kind of, we talked about today, so I won't go back through the list of how to generalize and how to learn about states we haven't exactly seen and so on. But it's crucial to understand that when we talk about expression programs or active chromatin marks or many other things, it's not that all the cells are the same. So a liver cell is a liver cell. A liver cell has some characteristics, but if it's undergoing something, it expresses genes based on, on the history of the patient the genetics maybe, and many other things. Um, and I think I'll, uh, I'll stop here and uh, say thank you to my group and my wonderful collaborators, and thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Nir. Do we have questions for Nir? One here. Now I find the clock. I had tons of yeah. times. So I could have so <laughs> Following on your, the chip seek for the histones that you showed, so the, the uh, a complex of an engaged RNA polymerase with the, the template DNA actually threaded yeah. through it is also at least as stable as a nucleosome. So have you looked at whether you can chip RNA polymerase in CFDNA? Um, it's a good question. We were thinking about what kind of other proteins will be tied, so we think about CTCF and things like that. I don't know enough about apoptosis, what happens to polymerase during apoptosis. I, I can tell you that there is DNA condensation and, and the desmethylation marks survive, acetylation marks do not survive, so the ones we looked at and, and we read about. Um, it's a great question whether Paul 2 is, is there or not. I knew your lovely talk. Um, I missed perhaps the minimal fraction that a cell type has to be present in order for the deconvolution to be successful, because you said the deconvolution is a challenge. So how, how heterogeneous does it have to be before it becomes just impossible because everything is present at such a low frequency that you cannot okay. deconvolve successfully? So, so that's an easy question to state, harder to answer. So I'll, I'll try to say, in this, when I do a simulation and I assume that all the cells are exactly like they are in the atlas, we can go down to very small fractions because we are measuring genome-wide, so we're looking at hundreds, hundred thousand locations, and if there are enough unique ones, we can do that. The problem is that life doesn't behave that way. And, and so if you just go do that blindly, you start getting a lot of things that are obvious false, false calls. Um, one of the things we are excited about are enhancer marks because enhancer marks are, there are many enhancers that are tissue specific. So even if the same gene is used in many tissues, the enhancer that turn it on, many of them will be specific to a particular cell type or cell program. Um, the annotation level of those things is much more of a mess. So liver, I probably can detect at levels of sub, uh, um, you know, one tenth to one hundredth of, of a percent. But liver is a very well-documented and very distinct organ uh, to work with. Other things, depending on the amount of prior knowledge. So if you want to know whether a particular gene is expressed, that's much harder than saying, 
Here are 100 genes, are they together going up slightly? I have a strategic question. Uh, so, um, I'm bracing myself. <laughs> how much uh, uh, DNA um, you think is lost during the procedure? So, so here's my, que my question really means, is there lots of room uh, for becoming even much better uh, in, in you know, detecting meaningful uh, data? Um, or have you already reached kind of the limit of sensitivity? Okay. Um, so just to recap something I probably should have said or said very briefly, there are a few nanograms in, a, in, a, in one ml of, of plasma. So we're talking about um, thousands of cells, roughly worth of, of material in a healthy person. In a sick person, it could be much more or much less. Um, we tried really hard to do estimates of how much, how much of that input material we're actually capturing. Um, and we tried, like, a, a good physicist will tell me that I need three different ways of calculating. We managed to find two orthogonal ones, and both of them give us roughly the same answer, so we kind of believe them, and we capture somewhere between, depending on the sample, 1% to 0.1% of the original material that we were searching for. Is this good or bad? It's, I think for cheap, it's actually pretty good. Is there a room for improvement? Yes. Um, but we can think of multiple X chip from the same sample to get multiple antibodies, you know, multiple marks. And, I mean, there are many things that can be done. 